Welcome and thank Hi everyone, welcome and thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Erin O'Brien. I'm Assistant Dean and Chief Enrollment Officer for the University at Buffalo School of Management. We are excited to have you join us this evening for a discussion on how we celebrate and foster diversity, equity, and inclusion in the UB School of Management, in our academic programs, and in our student faculty and staff communities. I would like to start our discussion this evening with a quote that I thought, thought was quite inspirational. Um, and as I was preparing my remarks for this evening, uh, I came upon a recent DEI address made by the commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Hester Pierce. And she states, um, because they were talking about um, uh, uh, financial aspects and she states, people are not fungible. Rather, each person comes to the table with a unique perspective formed through an intricate mixture of personality, personal and professional experiences, core values, education, past triumphs and trials, fears and foibles, influence from family and friends, and hopes for the future. We cannot appreciate that beautiful, complicated blend that makes up a person simply by looking at the person. We can only appreciate it by getting to know the person. Knowing one characteristic or to which group someone belongs is not enough. And I thought that was a fitting quote for this evening as we talk about how we build these communities within our campus. As leaders, we have both an obligation and an opportunity to develop a business community where we can address inclusiveness in all areas of education and employment, in entrepreneurship, in health and wealth, and that will all help us to transform our communities. So how do we do that here at the University of Buffalo? Starting from the top, diversity and inclusion have been at the forefront of our university presidential agenda. Our president's advisory council on race has focused on four key areas, recruitment, hiring, and retention of faculty and staff, recruitment and retention for students, curriculum and teaching, and community building. And one result of that, is we've established diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders in each one of our units on campus. Tonight, you'll get an opportunity to hear from our DEI leader, Professor Marianne Rogers. And in the School of Management, we seek to build a world of transformational leaders and organizations who change society for the better. And we do that by providing educational resources for our underrepresented minority students and helping them to advance their academic and professional networks and careers. We work with organizations like Forte Foundation, National Black MBA, Prospanica, Reaching Out MBA for LGBT, LGBTQ students and the PhD project and more. We've created programs like the First Generation Mentor Program for students. And we're always working towards a more inclusive and faculty, faculty and staff hiring process for representation among the professional ranks within the school. Finally, in our session today, we've brought together a panel of alumni who will share their own experiences on what diversity and inclusion mean on the UB campus how our students and alumni and faculty and staff in academic programs like the MBA, the professional MBA, the executive MBA, and the masters of science work hard to make a positive impact in our own building in the greater UB community through strong academic and career outcomes, which in turn will positively impact diversity challenges in society. We'd like to welcome you, Anshal, Brandon, Stephanie, and Danielle. It's great to see you. I'm thrilled that you're gonna be sharing your experiences with us tonight. Before we get started, I have some housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available in the post-event um, digital library. Megan Wood, our colleague, will provide the link in the chat box for you. We'd love to see your beautiful face. So if you feel like turning on your camera, please do. And if you have any questions, please ask away in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and do our best to answer your questions during the session. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to um, uh, our moderator this evening, Aaron Shaw, who's going to bring on uh, Professor Rogers and our panelists, Aaron. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, and before we do get into uh, Professor Rogers' background and her role uh, at the School of Management, I would like to highlight uh, some other folks that are joining us this evening as a part of what we consider to be your success team. 
Uh, Aaron mentioned Megan Wood earlier, who's the director of recruitment and admissions. Myself, uh, playing the role of assistant director of recruitment for our MBA and MS programs. Rebecca Ott, who plays the role of assistant director for our EMP MBA programs, as well as Pam Kroyak, who's our assistant associate director, excuse me, in our Career Resource Center. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, what an important topic, and that's why we're all here today. So first, I want to introduce Marianne Rogers, uh, who's the Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and a Clinical Associate Professor for Organization and Human Resources Department. Welcome, Professor Rogers. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you so much, Aaron O'Brien. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here. I am also an Executive MBA graduate uh, from many moons ago and uh, quite familiar with that program. And I also teach of the day program, the PMBA program, and uh, I've taught in the executive MBA program in the past. So welcome everyone. Um, so my role, I was appointed in 2019 as our school's uh, diversity and inclusion officer. And it's my role to build and find ways to grow opportunities and to figure out how to elevate our school's presence in that area. And that, that just involves like a multitude of things. I always say we look around the school, we look at every corner of our school. There's always an opportunity there to do something in regard to DNI. Um, I work with faculty, staff, students, uh, with alumni, of course, and other organizations in the Western New York community. And in addition to developing our own initiatives, my office seeks partnerships and relationships to further the scope of our mission wherever possible. We will work with anyone and everyone to further our, uh, our goals in this area. And, um, you know, I, we understand that we can never do enough in the DNI in the DNI spaces. We, we really just can never do enough. And we know that we will never be finished with this work either. There just, you know, simply is no finish line. Um, this work will continue for, for decades, most likely. Uh, we work as a team here in the School of Management. Our, our team is deeply committed along with our Dean uh, Dean Teslick deeply committed to DNI issues, and we just want to improve as much as possible uh, before the time comes where we will pass everything off to the next generation. So that's uh, just in, in a nutshell how how I see DNI in our in our efforts in the school. Yeah, and, and what a great point that there there is no finish line, right? There's no. continuous conversation, there's continuous action, uh, day in day out uh, to really impact change um, and move towards what we all have in mind in terms of where we wanna be in relation to DEI. Um, turning our, my attention to our panelists, as Aaron O'Brien mentioned, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's, it means so much that you've taken some time out of your busy schedules to share your stories here with us this evening. Uh, I'm gonna have you go around and introduce yourselves. Tell us uh, what program you did when you graduated and what you're currently doing. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. So Angel, you're up first. Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me. I was part of Masters in Management Information System program at UB and I, I, was, in, I was part of the class of 2018, 2019. Uh, right, uh, I think fresh out of UB, I just uh, joined Deloitte as a senior consultant and just recently I moved to Amazon and I'm working as a technical program manager there. And um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, very good, thank you so much. Brandon. Hey everyone, great to great to see you all here. Uh, I'm Brandon Glasgow. I graduated out of the MBA program class of 2018. Um, I'm currently working at Google as a global business development manager in our partnership space. Stephanie. Hey everyone, it's really good to be here tonight. I am Stephanie Tisdale. I'm a vice president at m and Bank here in Buffalo, New York. And I currently work as a strategic initiatives lead for the enterprise, as well as a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy lead for the bank. And I'm a graduate of the EMBA <laughs> program, 2019. COVID almost got us, I almost forgot, but. <laughs> it's hard to keep up these days, right? <laughs> right. Very good, and Danielle. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Danielle Vasquez. I was a graduate of a dual degree program at the University of Buffalo School of Management and School of Public Health. Uh, did a concentration of healthcare administration 
I currently am in Chicago as a director of support services for Rush University Medical Center. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Danielle. Jumping into the questions, uh, Professor Rogers, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? Just get up here. Well, um, sort of echoing Dean O'Brien's definition, the way that we see it in its broadest context is understanding that each individual is unique, recognizing our individual differences, including among other things, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, physical abilities, religious beliefs, political beliefs and other ideologies and characteristics and differences that others might have from us. Um, so we, we uh, consciously think about diversity through many different lenses, as you just heard. And you know, truly our school is very diverse. We have an international faculty, we have many students that are international. Um, so we, we celebrate that diversity um, and you know, we feel very, very fortunate to work in an environment like that. My focus mostly um, focuses on underrepresented minorities and those populations where we really, again, have a lot of work to do in that area. So um, we embrace all forms of, diver of diversity, knowing that there's a specific need for the URM population. Um, so inclusion is a state of being valued and respected and supported. It's about focusing on the needs of every individual and ensuring that the right conditions are in place for each person to achieve his or, or her full potential. So we um, very much think about removing obstacles and just making things easier for everyone that just needs some, um, some extra attention, extra help, or just maybe um, linking to extra resources or whatever it might be. Um, very good. Yeah. Go okay, ahead. excellent. Um, and you touched on it quite a bit during your introduction, but is there anything that you'd like to elaborate, maybe projects that are currently going on um, that are helping to cultivate diversity and inclusion in the School of Management? Yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, we, have, we have many priorities, and I just selected a few that I thought might be of most interest to, to this audience here tonight. Um, our, the challenge that we're always concerned with is um, increasing faculty diversity. We hear over and over and over from our students that when a faculty member looks like our students, it's just so meaningful in terms of um, a role model, figuring out how to um, open, open doors and, and to maybe get to that position themselves. And um, it, it's, it's gonna take us a while, but we're working on it with all of our might, with all of our collective might. And it has a lot to do with, of course, how we, um, how we search and how we seek applicants for faculty positions, really completely turning our networks upside down, um, trying to think in really new, novel and innovative ways, finding new um, connections and networks and, and really working to um, expand our pools, our applicant pools, so that we can come to a better outcome um, in terms of hiring an underrepresented minority. Um, there's a lot of competition for this. Every college and university in the US is, is indeed in the competition, but it's, uh, we, you know, we, we actively think about it. We're always talking about it. What can we just do differently? There must be something else that we can do in addition to what we traditionally have been doing. And, um, uh, you know, along those lines, what can we do to make that situation better? We think perhaps on building the pipeline um, working um, with the same thought process on the PhD level to expand the number of PhD students in certainly, you know, in our school, but to, to help society on the whole and to put more candidates into the pipeline is something that's also a, prior, a priority for us. As you heard Dean O'Brien say, um, we think a lot about how we can best support our students. Our day program last year had 14 Black and African American students enrolled in it. And uh, the program director for that program and I periodically sit down with that cohort and we ask them what they need. What would help them thrive? What would help them feel more welcome in our school? Sometimes it's something like a social event. You know, um, We were asked, could we just have a picnic um, in, in the beginning and to, to help this cohort find one another 
and to develop friendships with one another and, and to be able to support one another as they go through the MBA program. And you know, we certainly saw the wisdom in that once we when we listened to this group and, and just asked what they really needed. Mentoring opportunities came up. Um, sometimes it's even something as simple as tutoring that we just didn't know if someone's really kind of struggling with a part of a course, you know, we can help with all of that. So really building awareness as to what these populations need and just really standing by and being willing to jump in and, and again, to remove those obstacles. If, some, if someone's struggling with anything in particular, chances are we can, we can always find a solution, you know, and, and just us building the awareness in, in that particular area we, we, we're finding is very helpful and um, and we're hope you know it's making the, the MBA experience better on the whole. We cover student memberships, as you heard Dean O'Brien say, in organizations whose primary mission is to drive increased diversity and inclusion in the workplace and academia and society. So we can do something like we can cover memberships in those particular organizations. We can send our students to conferences where they make invaluable connections with um, uh, other you know, successful professionals in a, a variety of fields that can really help our students see the landscape and see the opportunities that might be, you know, before them that they, they wouldn't be able to see on their own. We have uh, diversity and inclusion related programs and trainings. Once a semester, we bring an expert in to help train us say on implicit bias. Last spring, the business school deans all joined together to have a conference on diversity and inclusion. And it was very, very powerful. And everyone in a SUNY business school across the state was able to attend and, and learn. So things like that. We're developing pathways for the youth of Western New York. We have several committees that are working to get into the inner city to let students know, young students, seventh, eighth grade, high schoolers, to let them know that we are here, that we have um, so much to offer and um, to, again, show opportunities to welcome them here as young people, very young people, so that they hopefully keep the School of Management and UB in mind when they get to be college age, that you know, they have the awareness of this beautiful campus and that we really want them here. We celebrate diversity and inclusion. We have different town halls and um, inclusive conversations throughout the year, especially when times are troublesome or when the occasion merits. Um, we had, for example, a forum last spring about, um, you know, some of the, the Asian situation, the Asian experience in the United States, which sometimes isn't great, and, and the treatment that a lot of Asians were dealing with. We addressed that as a school. We just had an open town hall. We listened to our students. We let them express what was on their mind. Uh, we will do that as often as needed. It's, it's always a good idea to open our doors for that kind of uh, conversation. We launched a particularly successful role model series where our outstanding um, URM graduates have gone on to do just stellar things and we bring them back so that our students can talk with them and figure out how they progressed through these careers that you know on the surface look like they have almost impossible odds, but these students conquered and they, they prevailed and they just serve as wonderful examples and role models that everyone enjoys hearing from. And there's other things like we're working through philanthropy to raise money for certain parts of the school for students that need different things. Um, scholarships, we're looking at professorships again to be able to get role models in the classroom in front of the class and uh, to support our organizations and clubs and uh, things like that. So I, I could go on, but you know, you get the idea. We're gonna leave some time at the end for questions and I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Safe to say a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing. And you know, with such a complex conversation, uh, I think it's important to point out, it's, sometimes it's the, it's the little things, it's the simple things, right? Like you said, what do you need? How can we help? Just asking the question rather than avoiding it and, and assuming. So, so, so important there. Thank you so much. Uh, Anshul, a uh, question for you. Can you speak to your experience in terms of engaging with themes related to diversity, equity, and inclusion as a part of your time here at UB? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so I'll start with as an international student coming from a totally different country, Inclusion diversity was a big part to adjust to Buffalo, not just 
to the people to the culture to the weather as well so it was all together a different journey and um, and there uh, and my experience at ub um, although my program was just one year i uh, think it went really smoothly because there have been a lot of diversity communities like me coming from india there is already a graduate student uh, in indian student group gsa which is very active and um, they were always there to support um, and also i was surprised that a lot of indian festivals being also celebrated at our university which made me feel like home and um, not only that i guess um, they, i also participated in um, thanksgiving program which was thanksgiving without border program which helps help me understand the culture of the uh, this country better being blending in how a family celebrate thanksgiving and a lot of people uh, were warmly hosted as many of me and my friends were part of that program as well which um, really helped me blend in and um, i think this uh, joining amazon and, and deloitte as well uh, i found certain similarities in a way that uh, diversity and inclusion is across this country in a way they embrace the culture of, of people who bring from different countries like me whether it's to celebrating festivals or whether it's to accommodating uh, to new culture or weather i remember going to a shopping trip as well by by buffalo to do my all my winter shopping so that was really fun uh, and which was organized by uh, the university and um, we, we were all told how to prepare ourselves for the winter because um, it i coming from a tropical land that was very different and um, uh, i believe uh, not just festivals and uh, not just festivals i i, I think uh, i also got the uh, got really good opportunities across my program uh, where where it came to uh, women in technology programs or uh, uh going for career fairs or getting getting um, funds i guess it was go fund and uh, a lot of other things which uh, helped me, made my journey and made my experience at ub really feel like home and i am really honored to be and i'm really grateful for whatever experiences i had and i had amazing time so uh, and now coming to amazon we again um, it's it's somewhat similar in, in a way that we We have women in engineering programs. We are part of. We we are going here at Amazon to Grace Hopper events, which was also something similar to what I was doing at UB. So it's a culture, I guess. I started with, and I'm experiencing it now. So, yep, uh, that that was my uh, experience. Very good, outstanding. Thank you so much, uh, Brandon. Leaders and organizations need to be fully bought in and behind DEI initiatives. After all, change comes through action, as we talked about earlier, not just words. To achieve this, leaders need to go through a personal self-examination -exam process at the individual level. Could you speak about what that process might involve for you? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm on mute. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hey, thanks, Aaron. I think I think that's a great question, and and you know, I think knowing yourself is really critical to be an effective leader. I think building self-awareness and really understanding um, your own tendencies and motivations can help you unlock potential for yourself and also your people around you, right? So you think about your colleagues, your friends, your, your family. Um, so really my, my self-examination, I think I can, I can bucket in, in three things. I think the first one is, is blocking out the noise, um, really being able to identify your own truth. Ask yourself, what is it that you believe? There's so much noise, right? There's social media, there's news, there's opinions from people shaping how we think. I think if you really think about, um, if we want to compare it to, to listening to music on the radio, right? Like there, there's certain songs that you absolutely don't like, but you hear it so much on the radio and you find yourself singing it and humming it. And you almost start to make yourself believe that you like it, although that may not be true. Um, and, and that's a very soft example, but think about how critical that could be if you're thinking about uh, shaping DEI, right? Like your opinions, your thoughts, and your beliefs aren't even really yours. So I think blocking out the noise and really starting to assess yourself is the first thing. I think checking your unconscious bias is the second part. Um, I, you know, we're human, we all have biases, unconscious, and conscious. And I think for the unconscious biases, there's an opportunity for you to get training. You know, organizations, schools, 
uh, Google, you can all find this information online. What type of training can I do to um, realize some of the biases that I, I may not be uh, aware of, right? So my blind spots. And I think for the conscious bias, which humans, we all also have, right? We're aware of the things that um, we're biased against, whether or not we want to change our opinion. Um, you really have to take that and, and, and understand, okay, well, are those conscious biases impacting my ability to um, make DEI calls, right? Is it impacting my ability to help shape my organization? And sometimes, sometimes that's, that's the case, um, but you have to identify that and be really self-aware. Uh, and, I, and I think finally, you know, if I was doing an assessment, I would, I would do uh, an assessment of, of like my social inventory, right? And, and I'm thinking about the people around me, which is equally important, right? You're, you're assessing yourself. And part of that is assessing like the influences, uh, making sure that the people who are sitting at your table or that you're surrounded by are truly diverse people who are um, helping you um, make a change, right? Like those people are challenging you. They're helping you drive DEI and, and, and really pushing you to see, you know, whether or not you're making the right calls. Um, I think, you know, passion for DEI um, is one thing and it has to also be coupled with um, strategy and expertise. The, the passion is what makes you wake up in the morning and, you know, go to your organization and say, hey, we need to push this issue. We need to have these conversations about, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion here. I want to I want to shift this workforce. I think the strategy and the execution is what's going to help you get it done. Um, so you need both. You need both types of people who have both types of the skill sets. Right. You need someone who's going to say it loud and proud and you need someone an ex who, who can be an expert or, or is willing to do the, the nitty gritty work to push change. So, so really, those are those are the three elements. You know, blocking out the noise, um, checking your unconscious bias and your conscious bias, um, and and assessing your 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 social surroundings, and, and that's really uh, how I would go about you know my my personal assessment. Yeah, awesome insight, uh, awesome approach. Thank you so much, uh, Danielle. Brandon mentioned uh, having the ability to help shape your organization. So along those lines, if you were given the opportunity. Uh, can you speak to what you feel would make for a successful strategy concerning ways to create opportunities for historically marginalized uh, and or, or underrepresented folks, excuse me? Yeah, and I think you cannot create strategy without removing barriers. So I think that a lot of strategic development in top organizations is honestly reflecting back on the organization's mission of how they would remove barriers for these marginalized populations. So whenever I think of diversity and inclusion, specifically for my departments that I run, it's not just race, race and ethnicity, it's gender equality, sexuality equality, disability equality. So when I think about creating an appropriate strategy, I think about the populations that I serve, one, in the community as a healthcare organization, but two, as my staff and employees. So um, just going from race, one is like, is there any application barrier or language barrier that they go through when applying to a position at Rush or whatever institution that I oversee? Um, if you go back to gender equality, it's whether or not as a woman myself, um, what I look for, especially in a healthcare organization, is there childcare opportunities for one, one day if I raise a family or an individual that I have has a family that they need to go and receive childcare and might have to shift their hours of service or hours of work to be able to bring their child to daycare. Um, whenever I think about sexuality or gender inclusion, I think about whether or not my transgender populations have uh, the appropriate uh, surgical care or health care to be able to get the medical care that they need. Um, and I did see a question in the chat box about admission fees. I mean, I think we have to be realistic as a society that um, people of color or people that are mar marginalized populations uh, don't have the same cut of socioeconomic as well as uh, financial economic status in this nation. So we really have to see the barriers that get them to the point of application in order for us to instill appropriate strategy. So I always think about barriers before I create strategy. And then what Brandon said, bringing the appropriate people to the table. So who do I have to the table to make those decisions? Um, from a race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality perspective, 
Um, but then also, how do they have a voice at the table? So at least from my team's perspective, every single week, a different person has to present a different initiative. Um, it's not just me presenting initiatives within my department. It's that stakeholder that I nominate uh, who's next. And that from the intern that currently interns in my department all the way up to the vice president um, that oversees the healthcare operations. I think everyone has a voice to the table because everyone brings a different thought process or a different idea to the table. So uh, that's kind of the long answer, but you cannot create strategy without removing barriers, especially for historically marginalized populations. No, great answer. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and you mentioned barriers there, obviously. And, and so putting the spotlight on your own personal experiences in terms of climbing the ladder to success, what barriers have you experienced or do you anticipate experiencing as you continue to climb that ladder? For sure. Um, that's a very loaded question, but I think um, a lot of people on the line could probably speak to their barriers that uh, they've experienced. I mean, even from the start, when I was in third grade, I knew I was always going to have to work uh, three times harder than my peers. Just the fact that I am black, I am a Hispanic woman, I am a woman. Um, so there's different intricacies for that um, and different intersectionalities. I think when I got into the working world and when I was applying to kind of nationally recognized uh, fellowships throughout the nation, I realized the kind of skewed uh, application process that sometimes people of color or people that don't come from Ivy League institutions um, face. And I actually raised that uh, to my kind of application committee for fellowships, at least at Rush University Medical Center, to remove um, the school requirement that you have to be a top 25 school um, in order to be considered for a fellowship because personally I, I beat those odds and personally I think just because you don't go from like an, an Ivy League like Harvard, Yale, it doesn't justify your capability of being a great operational leader and I hope that I prove that at this point in my career but I think it's just once you get into a position of power again going back to removing whatever barriers that you've experienced in your life um, to help those that are moving forward in, in the institution or industry that you currently run. So I removed one barrier. There's other barriers that I face every day. Um, age is one of them. Um, being in the healthcare environment, the industry is just very, um, I wouldn't say old, but aged. And I think we're moving towards a more technological environment. Brandon can probably speak more be coming from Google or even um, Amazon as well. I think that we are moving forward to future diverse thought. Um, but I, I would challenge people, like, once you get into a position of power, you look into the barriers that held you back from the beginning, um, and you try to instill change that way. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Stephanie, uh, shifting the conversation to you, and Brandon mentioned in his, his uh, response, biases and consciousness. And so I want to talk about... Um, you know, the fact that we as human beings naturally, I don't think it's a secret at this point, kind of gravitate towards familiarity, right? Folks that look like us, sound like us, act like us, talk like us. So in what ways have you been able to show up for a community or a particular group that you don't identify with? I think that's a wonderful question <clears throat> and something that people should think about a lot more when they reflect on themselves. And one thing I would say is, so one of the enterprise initiatives that I lead is our initiative to map the journeys of our Black employees at the bank to understand, is their experience different? How is it different? Why is it different? And at first glance, you know, a lot of folks would think, okay, you're trying to improve the Black employee experience, when at the heart of it, what I'm trying to do is improve the employee experience for all 20,000 of us. And so what that in turns looks like is if I'm addressing isolation, for example, in the Black community at m and I should be addressing that for women. I should be addressing that for the LGBTQ plus community. You know, we're solving across the board. So by the time you get to mapping the journey of, you know, our Native American employees, we've hopefully solved so many things in the journeys that were stood up before that we've already shown up for you by hopefully removing some of those roadblocks and paying it forward to say this needs to change for everyone, not just the community we're addressing. And what that turned into in turn was me um, actually developing a playbook of saying this is in wave one of my work, what I did, how I did it, and we should be able to scale and replicate this for every, you know, underrepresented community here at the bank. 
Uh, and, you know, it's been great to see the journeys that have now started to get stood up. Latinx journey mapping, you know, Asian Pacific journey mapping, LGBTQ plus journey mapping. And uh, what I do is make sure that the, the rewards that the rewards that we've reaped from, you know, turning insights to action with my initial work reflect through so that no one's reinventing the wheel if they're addressing concerns they have you know this is what worked for us this is maybe how you can tailor it for yourself and I think where that shines through the most for for me showing up for another community right now would would certainly be the LGBTQ plus journey mapping work that's happening because I'm working directly with you know the equivalent to myself who's leading that work and saying, you know, this is what I learned. This is how I think you can benefit from it. This is what I think you might need to tweak or tailor because it does not fit your experience because these are not cookie cutter experiences. So I, I do my best to make sure that for as much as I can remove the burden of figuring something out for the next person, like I'm going to interject myself and I'm going to put myself there as a resource and as an advocate for them to make it that much easier. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Great strategy. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Rogers, often as diverse candidates move further into their careers and climb the proverbial ladder, they tend to see less diversity near the top. How are you thinking about how UB and the School of Management specifically can prepare a more diverse set of leaders to graduate in the future? Thank you, Aaron. Well, not surprisingly, we recognize that business today is truly global. Um, pandemic or no pandemic, it just is. And well-equipped business professionals really have to have the cultural sensitivity and the insight in order to work with multicultural networks. So by design, there is a great deal of teamwork in all of our programs. Um, our student populations are pretty diverse. And, and again, they're from all over the world. And um, we know that that extensive amount of group work really helps to give our students a leg up as they continue to develop as professionals. We have a program called Leader Core. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to hear about it, but it's a leadership program in the Day MBA program that helps students develop on nine different leadership competencies. And one of them is a global and diversity mindset. And, and to be certified in that program, you have to have all the competencies mastered. So there's a really nice opportunity there to develop that kind of work and, and to grow through that particular dimension. We have a very popular and a very amazing global programs. Um, and it is uh, run by Professor Dorothy Saya Asamoah, who is fantastic. And it provides our students with the chance to travel and study in a variety of domestic and international locations. You would think that a pandemic would bring a program like that to a grinding halt, when actually it was deftly, deftly uh, switched to um, online where none of the learning was lost. Unfortunately, our students couldn't really travel to those places, but they were able to virtually immerse themselves in them and just learn so much um, about just a, an array of cultures and places on the globe. Um, our faculty are strongly encouraged to integrate examples of underrepresented minorities as protagonists in their case studies to um, engender discussion in the classroom. And we are training them as to how to reflect more inclusiveness. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you know, putting statements in the syllabi that the classrooms are inclusive. And you know, using people of color and minorities in um, again their cases, data sets, examples, anywhere, any other material where that really becomes important to, to integrate that into the classroom, just making everyone feel a lot more welcome and feeling like you know they, they belong, along with helping everyone understand the importance of diversity and, and being able to, to recognize it and work with, work with it. Um, diversity training is provided to our students in a couple of courses and in orientations and things like that. And uh, I guess we already mentioned that we cover the student memberships and conference costs for national organizations. And um, there's a lot of opportunity in our student-led DNI committee. We have three committees in our school. We have, I, I think I forgot to mention that, a, a staff committee on DNI, a faculty committee, and a student committee. And the student committee is very, very active. There's chances for students to develop as leaders there, but moreover, they create and they host a lot of different events 
that expose our students to diverse perspectives and thought. And they're just doing a great job there. They're working among MBA students and they're setting up a lot of programming for our students to participate in. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like a recipe for success. And I think uh, if you need any proof of that, our panel is, is proof positive that the UB School of Management does play a significant role in putting fantastic leaders out into the workforce. Um, so Angel, up next, uh, I think we can all agree that we wouldn't be here today without incredible mentors in our lives. How has mentorship helped guide you uh, along the lines of these critical topics that we're discussing here today uh, and ultimately to your current success? I guess my uh, mentorship actually played an important role in my uh, career so far from the very beginning when I was planning to do my master's. So I was, I joined one of these webinars, I remember, and I connected with the alums and the current students of the School of Management. And uh, during these, one of these web webinars, I learned, okay, uh, I can, even if I'm across the borders and I am still planning to come, I'm not sure yet. I, I, I started talking to a lot of people who have done great things in life after graduating from UB. So it, uh, it they helped me, uh, uh, they helped me through just, you know, from the very scratch, whether it's from picking the right courses, which specialization, which kind of courses I should be taking in my uh, semesters, which certifications should I pursue. And, um, uh, and also as an international student, I also got a lot of uh, my visa and my immigration questions answered through uh, people who are who face similar uh, issues like me, who came from a different country or who are not um, citizens and they have a different path and a different journey. So I was actually able to connect with the people, uh, not just related to my success at career, but also the issues we face, okay, uh, what, how to go through immigration, because there's a lot of false information out there. We really need people who can directly, uh, correctly put, put words in direction and calm everything down, not focus on the uh, false news coming across and just have everything set in place, which, which actually a uh, mentorship really helped me. And uh, when I joined UB, I, I connected, I had multiple uh, mentors, which helped me in form of my professors, career resource centers, Melissa being one of them, which I'm very thankful of. And a lot of other uh, people I connected and my peers as well became my mentors throughout um, who were coming across from the globe and as well as from US. So uh, it, it helped me um, understand a lot of things, whether it was uh, related to my courses, whether it was related to how to uh, adjust in this country. And um, also, um, uh, when 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 the time came when I was looking for jobs, that was the most crucial part. We uh, we all all of us were enrolling in master's program, want to seek a, a job outside uh, of our college, and that was the most crucial time where mentorship played a huge role because I st I connected with somebody back in India through one of these webinars. That over the time, I developed that relationship, which actually helped me get a lot of reference. I also went to Network New York, which is uh, which was organized by School of Management for us to go to uh, uh, a career fair, uh, Network New York to New York City from Buffalo and just attend and meet people from across the companies, across different, uh, uh, the very diverse group of people and also helped me connect with a lot of people, which in turn helped me in a combined way to get reference to the organizations, get my interviews and finally succeed and get a job. Uh, and I have a very interesting story when I was actually uh, moving from Deloitte to Amazon after two years of my graduation from UB, it was actually I found a lot of my uh, college um, alumni in uh, working at in Amazon in similar ro similar roles. And it, I connected with them and actually got a lot of really great insights about how the interview process is going to be, how do I prepare myself better. So I used to think um, mentorship ends with college and with uh, you know uh, first job out of your master's but it's actually continuing with me even after my second job switch at, at any place I go I find mentors in form of my alums or in form of my peers and there are a lot of people who are ready to help you it's all about connections and it's all about networking uh, with diverse group of people you never know what 
what just works in your favor and you never know what just benefits you two years ago you help somebody and two years later you are applying to an organization and they are ready to refer you or help you and guide you better how to interview so it's all about give and take and it it actually um, i continue to take that uh, with me uh, how relationships building and how networking helps you just succeed at your career because we only succeed when we help each other so it it actually gives me a feeling if somebody helps me i need to give that back as well and help at least other people so it uh, it it has been amazing for me in form of mentors incredible thank you so much for sharing brandon uh sticking with the topic of people right and, and considering all the people that you've met through your time at ub Perhaps uh, you've been able to come together with uh, a similar topic or thought that I have in relation to what I call uh, a leadership transformer, right? You meet all these great people, you take some attributes from this person, some from that, creating this, this dynamic image of, of what leadership and success looks like to you, allowing it to also evolve as time goes on. Um, so what are some of those attributes that you've seen or noticed that are essential for success? Oh, that's, a, that's another great question, and and um, I think you know it's kind of a reoccurring theme here, right? Um, it it's just not it's it's not easy, right? Like going navigating um, the working world is is not easy, and and really it takes a combination of, of hard work um, and opportunity. So I think the hard work aspect is is what you know the the attributes that people can carry right the tenacity the grit um, there's so 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 many barriers to entry as Danielle had mentioned I think for um, if you know thinking about you know DEI for people from underrepresented groups um, you know I think about people of color I think about women women of color even more so uh, you really have to go the extra mile like the universe is not set up for um anyone's success just to be handed to them you really have to work very hard and go after it and i think i, I saw that a lot with my colleagues at, at ub i saw that a lot at my my first job um, out of ub and now at google everyone is working extra hard to um, become quote unquote successful whatever that means in, in their own realm um, to accomplish whatever they want in life and and the second part is opportunity, which is another reoccurring theme here, right? I think to accomplish anything, it's essential for you to really um, have those opportunities, right? Like, you know, there's, we, we talk about, you know, being, being, being self-made, if we want to just use that like as it is. Um, but, but the other aspect of it is, is being um, given opportunities to succeed. I think even self-made people or the most successful people are given opportunities, whether it's, you know, um, through a mentor, through a sponsor, through an advocate, through people in your network, through a family friend, someone is putting you on to become a, a successful person uh, or, or to position you in, in a certain way. So, so really, you know, I think success is a combination of, yes, you having tenacity and grit and being able to kick through those barriers and um, go after the things you want, because um, if you don't, you will kind of just fold in this, in this um, <laughs> I, I, I think in this, in this life. Um, and another another part of it, which is super important, is is remembering with that the difficulties that you face and giving people the opportunity to um, you know level themselves up, right? So those are those are that's what I think. I think I think tenacity, grit, and, and opportunity. Yeah, fantastic attributes. Thank you so much for your thoughts, Danielle. Uh, sticking along the same lines of of your first question, kind of an extension of that, and, and potentially going back to the barriers piece. Uh, suppose that you encounter a persuasive belief that diversity and excellence are somehow in conflict. How do you conceptualize the relationship between diversity and excellence? Right. I think oh, Danielle, you, you're on mute. I was like Brandon for this, <laughs> but what I was saying um, <laughs> is I don't think I've ever run into that conflict because I actually think that diversity is excellence. Um, a couple months ago when I was reading an article from the Wall Street Journal with every 
increase of uh, diverse candidates, not uh, whether it be race, ethnicity, uh, sexuality, um, et cetera, uh, you have a 1% ROI, fiscally uh, responsible dollars that are generated with having a diverse leadership team. So I get kind of sometimes confused or kind of offset by that comment um, because I really think in order for an institution to move forward from their bottom line, it's probably their best interest to start considering diversity immediately in the candidates that they consider at a senior leadership level. And when you do have representation at a senior, ship, senior leadership level, it trickles down to our frontline representatives, um, those that work on the, the front line from a healthcare perspective, those that clean your room, those that are your medical providers that provide you care. Um, that is very, I'm very vigilant to that um, because as the director of support services, 80% of my staff are individuals of color. Um, I'm over environmental services, um, people that clean your rooms, um, but those individuals actually have the highest impact on quality scores, which is actually the highest impact on how we get reimbursed as a hospital. So how we make money is directly impacted to how patients think about how clean our rooms are or how secure our environment is as I'm over security or how quickly we can transport patients back to their home so they could be safe. Um, I think that I always think about how correlation between diversity is their sisters uh, in terms of how we think about excellence. So when you have that representation at a senior leadership level, at least what I saw when I first moved to Chicago and when I first got recruited from Rush, the first interaction I had and the past couple bosses that I've had were people of color, were women, um, were people that were uh, immigrants. And I've only had great experiences getting other people's perspectives um, from the from those uh, experiences that I had. So that would be my answer to that. Yeah, and, and what an incredible answer it was. Thank you so much for sharing. Stephanie, uh, we had discussed early on uh, with Professor Rogers, you know, the efforts that are that are happening in and around the School of Management and UB as a whole. Um, and the fact that it needs to be a continuous conversation to drive continuous action. So in your eyes, what does it mean to commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Gotcha. Another wonderful question. Um, <laughs> I, and I guess I'll just start by saying, I, I am going to speak for myself here, but there's something almost intangible about a commitment to DEI. And what I mean by that is a lot of, I feel the pitfalls that a lot of people and organizations in particular fall into are talking a lot about DEI or we do this, we have this program, we have this. And when you are an underrepresented person in those, like within that space or within that organization, and you just don't feel it, you still don't feel you belong. You still don't feel welcome. There's something almost intangible about the experience. So I think as far as a commitment to diversity, what that really feels like is we are willing to change this culture. We are willing to rid ourselves of people who go against the values of not committing to diversity in order to benefit the folks that we need to support. Uh, just speaking for my organization, you know, MNT historically has been very skewed um, towards, you know, older cisgender white males. So, you know, to, to have our culture shift from, you know, I've been around eight years at the organization. I remember when I came in and I'm like, well, there, and I very rarely say I can't make it somewhere. I was like, I don't know if here's the place for me to make it to the sweet suite. And, you know, even in the course of eight years, I've seen a total 180 of now we have a CEO who identifies as black. Now we have, you know, a, a vice chairman who identifies within the LGBTQ plus community. You know, there's all these shifts that have happened in what I consider a very short amount of time, as close to a decade as it might be. And I think that commitment, not just to the representation, but how are we, you know, not to make it hierarchical, but how are we reaching down and pulling folks up to the top ranks? How are we building that support and paying it forward? And, you know, one of the, the biggest initiatives I think I've seen executed that I've been on uh, an advisory council for is our bank-wide sponsorship initiative. And what's that to say is we all know mentorship exists. We all know it's great to have someone to reach out to for advice, to maybe get a little guidance. 
but what a sponsor does is they say your name when you're not in the room. They get you involved in things that you otherwise may not have had your eyes open to or had the opportunity for. And what they do is they advocate for you actively and proactively, regardless of, you know, who may be in that space or, you know, what someone else may think or someone else may doubt someone's capabilities. Uh, so I think a, a commitment to diversity is truly showing you're willing to acknowledge what's wrong, for lack of better words, and do your best to course correct and, and get on a better path to the, you know, on that spectrum of, of right that, that you would like to achieve. So. Yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you so much. And, and it sounds like you yourself are, are truly committed to it. So kudos for that. Um, that's going to do it for the panel conversation portion of this evening's uh, presentation. And I do want to say thank you to our panelists. So Angel, Brandon, Stephanie, Danielle, thank you so much for sharing your incredible wisdom, insight, and invaluable experiences with all of us. At this point, I do want to turn it over to my colleague, Rebecca, who is going to take over the Q&A portion of this, um, and our panelists will stick around for that. Uh, so if you have questions, start thinking about them uh, as we progress through this particular section. Thank you so much, Aaron. So as Aaron mentioned, my name is Rebecca, and I'm the Assistant Director of Recruitment for our EMP uh, programs uh, at the university. So before we uh, jump into the Q&A that you guys have uh, been doing via the chat, I'm definitely still ask your questions in the chat box. Um, but while you're doing that, I would like to ask Pam a quick question. Um, so Pam, as someone who is familiar with the career-related challenges that historically underrepresented students have to prepare for, what kind of strategies have you used to address these challenges and how successful were those strategies? Sure, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I, I really, um, it, things have really been changing in our program. As far as the Career Resource Center goes, I am one person that is part of our Career Resource Center graduate team. Um, I mainly am working with MBA students. I know Angela did a shout out to Melissa Ruggiero and she works with our MSMIS students and the different MS programs may work with Katie or Melissa or myself. And then Gwen, our director is also working with students and I think has worked with Danielle and Brandon a lot actually um, over the years. But really what we've done is really started to do outreach to our incoming students a lot sooner getting them more involved in national events. So the National Black event, Pro, Pro Spanica, these are national career for, fairs, and then RAMBA, the Reaching Out MBA, um, as well to get students more aware of these events happening um, and then able to prepare earlier for them. So a little more preparation, a little more earlier action on getting registered and getting noticed, and then more time to prepare for them as well. And, and many folks have mentioned mentors and kind of that professional board of directors. Um, we always recommend students find mentors um, if they have them already coming up through the program um, or during the program, they need to find mentors. So we're happy to connect students to alumni like themselves, different kinds of alumni, alumni at particular companies. But it's really important to have even more than one mentor. Because um, it's really hard for one mentor to kind of be everything to you. Um, different, different areas of your career development, um, you may want to learn more about leadership from, a, you know, someone who you have seen and worked for that is a fantastic leader. Or maybe you don't have that opportunity in your job or internship. You haven't seen that person yet. So maybe we need to help find you a leader in a different organization that you can get to know. Um, and really form a relationship with, obviously, over time. Um, but I think it's important that you think about having more than one mentor. And that is something that we always encourage as well, connecting with as many people as you can and, you know, building relationships. It takes time. And you're also not going to be able to connect with every person that you meet with. You know, they might not be on the exactly the same wavelength. Everyone's different. So it's important to kind of diversify your, your board of directors as well so you can get those different perspectives. Um, I think Danielle was mentioning barriers being removed. You know, we're actually seeing that a lot now. Um, we're seeing the virtual has kind of opened up um, employers 
they used to be really exclusive and only looking at those top 10 schools. And I think virtual has finally enabled them to kind of level the playing field a little bit and remove some of those barriers and stop looking at only top 10 schools um, to really diversify their workforce. In fact, uh, Unilever uh, is a consumer products company, CPG company in New Jersey. They no longer read school name in their applicant tracking system. It's just been removed. In fact, I don't even think they're re I don't even think they're reading the person's name. So they so, some companies have started removing those kinds of barriers from applicant tracking systems. Stop looking at zip code. Stop looking at the applicant name, and just actually go to their qualifications and keywords and whether they're really matching the postings. So we've seen that happening a lot. So like Unilever doesn't go to campuses anymore. They're, they're not going onto campuses. They used to only recruit at certain campuses and now they're no longer doing that. So the virtual world has kind of opened up some of that um, recruiting and exclusiv exclusivity and taken away some of those barriers, which is great. Even trends with resumes, we would recommend now you just list a city and a state, that's it. You do not list your full, full address any longer on your resume. Um, because you don't need them to look at that. You just, you, you know, you're trying to tell them, hey, this is where I'm located in the world right now at this moment, but that's really all they need to know. <laughs> you know, the rest is all about what you're bringing to the table and your skills and qualifications. And uh, I mentioned the national conferences, which definitely have more opportunities um, across the board for um, underrepresented um, folks. And, and also there's WOW Fund, which Marianne, I think, alluded to, or, or Aaron alluded to, that uh, our WOW Fund is also available in School of Management, which helps people with traveling to these conferences and those expenses as well. Um, so, and that application is open year round now. Reviews are happening on a rolling basis. So people can just apply for that when, when some professional development conference or event or something is happening that they want to participate in. And we can help, help you with that. And then I think for the Career Resource Center, probably the biggest thing that we can do for you is really get to know you on a one-to-one -one basis. That's really how we can help you. Uh, the more we understand who you are and what your individual interests are, what your challenges and barriers might be, like the more we can help you. We can help you to find alums. That's, I mean, primarily, that's what I, I constantly am thinking, okay, this person's reminding me of this alum, so I want to connect them to this person so that they can, they can find someone to talk to that's like themselves. Um, and, but it, anything really, I mean, we work with you on anything that you would need as far as, you know, maybe you haven't done a lot of networking or had mentors before and don't even know how to approach that. We can talk with you about that. We can help you work out, you know, an email to send. We can role play a conversation. We can help you prepare, you know, questions and what you want to talk about and, you know, how to talk about certain things that might be uncomfortable and to find the information that you need. Um, to help you begin these conversations. So really getting to know you and taking that individualized approach is really how we can help you the best because the more we can understand what you want, the more we can help you kind of get there and help you find the resources that you might need. And I think that's it. Great, thank you so much, Pam. That was some really great insight and some great advice. It's it's refreshing to hear some of the changes that some companies are making, kind of just removing those barriers. We see so much people talking about it, but to actually hear about it, action taking place is a very nice thing to hear. Um, so turning my direction over to the chat, there were some questions um, that you all had asked. So I was actually gonna ask Aaron O'Brien to address some of our admissions-based questions um, that came through. So the first one, uh, talking a little bit about um, how diversity and equity it, it, and if that would somehow impact an admissions decision, I guess we can kind of start with that question there. So I thought that was a very interesting question, and I want to thank um, uh, thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, so the University of Buffalo School of Management practices what's called holistic admissions, and when we say holistic admissions, that means that a candidate is not a score or a GPA or uh, a standardized test score or a job that they've had. Um, we ask for a lot of materials during the admissions process. Uh, and so, you know, we ask for transcripts, we ask for essays, we ask for um, coursework that you've taken. Um, you know, we, we ask for a whole bunch of, of materials and documentation within the admissions process. 
Uh, and finally, specifically for our MBA programs, we actually do a face-to-face -face interview with a candidate uh, where we have an opportunity to ask some in-depth questions. And the reason we do all that is because we know that candidates um, are more than what they present in their documentation. Um, they've, uh, just like I started with my opening comments, they're a complex uh, amalgamation of experiences and backgrounds and opportunities uh, and, and feelings and, and, uh, and thoughts and, so, uh, and, and aspirations and goals. And so when we, um, when we actually practice holistic admissions, we're looking at the entire candidate. And we've definitely admitted candidates before who have underperformed on uh, standardized test scores or GPAs or overperformed on standardized test scores and GPAs. We've admitted candidates with lots of work experience. We've admitted candidates with little work experience. Um, we uh, have tried to um, align our strategic funding with respect to building a cohort. And our goal is to build a diverse and successful cohort. And so we uh, we try to align admissions decisions and scholarship funding uh, because our scholarships are merit-based. Uh, and so at least the scholarships that we give uh, from the school perspective are merit-based. There are lots of need-based scholarships that are available. Uh, and so we try to make a one-to-one -one connection between candidates and, and the properly aligned scholarship. So um, we do have several diversity scholarships available for our candidates to review uh, in the, uh, both the MBA programs and the Masters of Science programs. Um, you'll see shortly up on our website, we've recently reinstated a specific um, scholarship called the Schomburg Fellowship, uh, which is a university fellowship that um, helps to um, boost the volume of underrepresented minorities within our cohorts. Um, you will see that uh, we have the Jacobson Diversity Scholarship um, in the MBA program and that position or that scholarship brings with it a position to have an opportunity to doubly impact diversity, equity and inclusion in the School of Management because it comes with an assistantship position working with Professor Marianne Rogers, who is our Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. So, um, so you have an opportunity to make even more of an impact. So when you talk about admissions, you really have to talk about kind of this whole experience of um, recruiting and admissions and scholarship and funding uh, so that we can, we can build those diverse, diverse cohorts. It's not a single threaded effort. Um, and so when, you know, going back to the actual question in terms of, you know, the impact of diversity and equity in our, our admissions decisions. It's very, very wide ranging in terms of impact. And, um, you know, I'll reiterate what Professor Rogers said, it, it, you know, we actively try to create a very diverse cohort across many, many, many dimensions, not just international or domestic, male or female, um, single degree or dual degree. Uh, underrepresented minority or uh, not an underrepresented minority. Not, we look across all of those dimensions to build a cohort that's going to be, um, create a rich experience for our students. So I hope that answers the question. Excellent, thank you so much, Erin. Kind of going off of that admissions-based question, there was a little bit of a conversation in the chat about fee waivers and how that can sometimes be a barrier. Yes. Uh, can you maybe speak to that a little bit more um, as to um, how that affects our international students and just your thoughts on that? Sure, it's not just international students who are affected by application fees or admission fees. Um, this is a challenge that the the current DEI movement actually brings to the forefront in terms of, you know, looking back across the college experience, the high school experience, and even the middle school, middle school experience as to whether or not somebody is actually able to afford the education uh, that they're seeking. Um, it's a greater problem than just an admission fee waiver or an application fee waiver. 
practically speaking, um, we're beholden to those application fees. We can't really waive them. So there's, there's a practical tactical aspect of this, but there's also a higher strategic mission that we have to be discussing. You know, are we creating the proper channels for our, our URM candidates to be able to, um, to enter into uh, you know, high school, selective high schools, selective colleges, selective graduate programs. Um, and, and, and I think it's a bigger, I think it's a bigger challenge. I don't think we've addressed it and I don't think we've solved it quite frankly. Um, and I do know that there is a financial, a practical financial hardship. Um, we have avenues to apply for financial hardship. Um, there, you, you there are avenues within the School of Management. There are avenues within the, the university. As a graduate student, you can converse with the Graduate Opportunity Program, the GOP program. Um, and if, as soon as we're done with this, I'll source up the uh, GOP website um, so you can have that at your fingertips. But um, those are university-funded um, programs that uh, help to reduce the financial burden for students. Um, and like I said, we have scholarship opportunities. But I would say finally, in the end, um, as with all graduate school decisions, you're making a bottom line decision, right? You're making a decision to invest in yourself, to advance yourself. And graduate school is expensive, just kind of at the beginning, right? From the very start, it's expensive for everybody. I think at the University of Buffalo, we provide an excellent return on investment because we have a very, um, high standard of academics. We have strong performance outcomes. Students get great jobs. Um, our MBA program, we just released our employment statistics. 91% of our MBA cohort in a pandemic was able to secure a career position coming out, uh, first position coming out of their MBA program. Uh, and that's the class of 2021. So we're talking about 91% in the middle of a pandemic. So, so those are really great numbers. This is, this is an investment in you. So I understand that there's financial hardship and I understand that MBA programs are expensive and I understand that graduate school itself is expensive. Um, and things like application fees or preparatory courses or um, you know, things that help prepare you to be more successful, I would encourage you to look at that as part of the overall investment that you're making in you. We have one of the strongest return on investments of any business school out there. Payback on our MBA degree is, is between two and four years. And so when you, even for international students, so when you look at the cost of your MBA program, don't look at the cost of the application fee because that's, you know, you're gonna have to pay an application fee. And, and I know it's a challenge. Think of it as part of the investment that you're making in yourself and, um, you know, it'll help you prioritize too where you want to apply to school. I think we have a very economical admissions uh, application fee, uh, as well as very economical tuition. If you're talking about, you know, one of the top 10 business schools in the world, where you might be paying $200,000 for your education and $1,000 for your application fee, I totally get that. I think that that is not a wise investment. Um, but I, I do think that um, looking at any application fee relative to the benefit that you're going to get out of that program is, is worth the investment. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that, Erin. My next question, I want to direct over to Mary Ann. Um, we had a great question from Diego who was asking if we could quantify or share any metrics that the School of Management tracks or that demonstrate success in the DEI space. So Marianne, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Rebecca. Beyond what uh, Dean O'Brien's office does, they pay very close attention to um, numbers and um, uh, candidates and so forth. So uh, we look at the, the class composition, we're able to get a handle on that pretty quickly as I think you know probably most schools are, but, uh, but that office in particular takes very good care of those numbers. We are trying to finalize a strategic plan that we've been working on for the last 18 months, just pulling together every area of the school and putting it together in a comprehensive document. And with that, go along some net, some metrics. So I can share a few of those with you. Increasing our faculty diversity, always top of mind. How do we measure that? The application rates of diverse candidates is something that we can measure. The hiring rates of diverse candidates 
and um, moving along the retention and promotion rates for diverse candidates and, and women faculty as well and figuring out how they're faring here. When we talk about a more inclusive classroom, we have a couple of tools. We have our course evaluations, whereby faculty are able to put a question into the course evaluation, did my classroom feel inclusive? Did you feel uh, like you belonged here? Things of that nature. We, you know, it, for faculty that want that information, they can pull it up very quickly, um, embedded within the normal course evaluations that take place at the end of the class, at the end of the semester. My office can review course syllabi and see how many faculty are putting a statement, an inclusive statement in, and, and really encourage faculty to continue that practice or adopt it if they're not doing it already. And we can put a question in our annual reports. You might not know this, but faculty have to complete an annual report at the end of every year, uh, reflecting different kinds of activities. If, uh, if it's like a tenure track faculty, how much they're researching, how much they're publishing, we have to report on the quality of our teaching, among other things, even you know, um, outside board commitments in the community. And there's room for questions on what our faculty did to put DNI into their course. So that's pretty cool. Um, supporting our students, we talked about you know um, the, the support for our students that, that we that we hope to continue to increase listening to our students and delivering to them what they need just to make things easier. We can the metrics there, the success and graduate rates of URM students in the School of Management programs, you know, is everybody making it through? We certainly want that. And a climate survey, which is currently being designed in my office, um, a survey for first and second year MBA students as to how it feels to work and study here. And um, looking at a, a bunch of different dimensions there that we really wanna hear, an anonymous survey, we wanna hear from our students as to how things are going for them here. Um, a few other things, celebrating diversity and inclusion, those town halls, those inclusive conversations, again, that would get picked up in the climate survey that we're about to send out in a couple of weeks. Um, looking at philanthropy, the uh, levels of support, the amount of scholarships raised and faculty fellowships and professorships, how much activity is going on there. Um, we're, we're looking at our advisory boards. We have seven advisory boards in our school and I'm working with uh, the liaisons to each of those boards to see if it's time to um, expand those boards, turn some seats over, bring on more graduates of color and, um, and, and you know, see if we can get a little bit more diverse over there. And that's just pretty easy to measure as to um, what the expansion of those boards would be. So we have things like that that we are capturing. I think the climate survey is, uh, is really crucial to execute every year so that we have our thumb on our finger on the pulse of, of how our students you know, feel about being part of our culture and our environment. Excellent, thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you, Erin O'Brien. Thank you, all of our panelists. I'm now going to uh, conclude the Q&A. So I'm gonna pass it over to Erin O'Brien to do some closing remarks for us. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, oh, there we go. So uh, Rebecca just popped up a slide that uh, has two QR codes on it, one for the MBA and Masters of Science programs and the other for our professional MBA. Uh, if you aim your cell phone camera, add the QR codes, it will pop up a link that will allow you to stay connected with us directly. Um, excuse me, uh, you'll have an opportunity to look at uh, events that we have, as well as um, events that we have scheduled, as well as opportunities to connect with current students uh, or either Rebecca uh, or Aaron um, and have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with them. So uh, I would encourage you to snap a quick pic of that so that you can take advantage of it later um, and, uh, and make sure that you stay connected with us. Um, and in the meantime, I want to thank our panelists again. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, to Anshul and Brandon and Danielle and Stephanie. And of course, Professor Rogers, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us, as well as your experience and your stories. I do wanna remind everybody that uh, this session has been recorded and will be available in our digital library on management.buffalo.edu. So if you're catching us on replay, thanks for, um, thanks for hitting us up in the digital library. 
Um, and uh, I want to wish our panelists uh, a most excellent evening uh, before we disconnect. And I want to thank everybody who joined us this evening. Um, if you do have further questions, make sure that you connect with us. Uh, you can al always reach us uh, by uh, on our website, management.buffalo.edu. And you can shoot us an email at somapps.buffalo.edu. At That's S-O-M dash A-P-P-S at buffalo.edu. So I'll ask our panelists to stick on and I wanna wish uh, everybody a good evening uh, and thank you again for joining us. <laughs>